So we'll take a little bit deeper look at the electromagnetic waves that Maxwell predicted and Hertz confirmed the presence of. And if we look, they actually have perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. And so in this case, it turns out if you have a changing electric field, it induces a magnetic field. And if you have a changing magnetic field, it induces an electric field. And so you have this weird synthesis with electromagnetic waves where the, the changing, the alternating electric and magnetic fields are inducing each other to propagate the wave. And so it turns out they're exactly in phase. They both reach a maximum at exactly the same point. So, but they're totally perpendicular in this case. The electric field in one plane, the magnetic field in a perpendicular plane, and the propagation of the wave happens perpendicular to both of them. Because it's perpendicular to both of them, that propagation of the wave, the velocity here, we refer to these as being transverse waves as opposed to longitudinal waves. So when it turns out this velocity for a wave we actually use the symbol C to represent it. So in that C, again, it's 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, as long as you're in a vacuum. If you're in air, it is just a hair slower, and we kind of use the same value. But in different mediums, it might actually take on different speeds. So what's interesting about these waves is they're different than most of the other waves physicists had classically studied. So if you study a wave on a string, you need a string. If you study a wave, a wave in the ocean, you need an ocean, you need water. So if you study a sound wave, you need a medium for it to pass through, whether it be gas, liquid, or solid. If you yell at somebody in outer space, they're not going to hear you. So however, we found out that whereas light can pass through a medium, it actually doesn't need one, it'll propagate through a vacuum. And that's how you know light traveling from the sun will reach the earth without there being a medium. So back in the day, they thought there was this ether everywhere outside the earth. That way there'd be a medium for light to travel through, but it turns out light doesn't need a medium in this case. So it turns out light slows down in other materials. So and we define what's called an index of refraction here for these materials. So we use the speed of light in a vacuum and V ends up being the velocity in the new medium. And so if, if the speed of light always slows down relative to a vacuum, then what should we expect for these indices of refraction? If the speed of light in a vacuum is always gonna be bigger than the speed in that medium. Yeah, they're always gonna be greater than one. And so in this case, air is like 1.008 or something like that, it's close to one. So, but if you move to like water, it's 1.33. What that really means is that light travels 1.33 times slower in water than it does in a vacuum. If you go to certain types of glass, the index of refraction is 1.5, means the same thing. It travels 1.5 times slower in glass than it does in a vacuum, so on and so forth. So these indices of refraction will come up a little bit later. I'll probably talk about it next week when we start talking about refraction, things of that sort. So for any wave, it turns out not just electromagnetic radiation, but for any wave, the wavelength times the frequency equals the velocity of the wave. And so in our case, for light, the wavelength of light times the frequency of light will equal the speed of light. And again, as long as we're talking about in a vacuum, that would be 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So it turns out, you know, Maxwell here predicted these waves, Hertz verified these waves, and they had all these wave-like properties like polarization and interference patterns and stuff. So however, later on, people started talking about light behaving more like particles. And so it turns out now we know that light's not a wave or simply a wave, and it's not a particle. It has the properties of both. We also learned out later than that, that matter, which we thought was particles, also can exhibit wave-like behavior and it has both behaviors as well. So kind of confirming uh, Maxwell's hunch that nature was symmetrical. So, but in this case, if we look at light or electromagnetic radiation as a particle, we can talk about what are called photons. So, and it turns out that the energy of one of those photons is related to Planck's constant, just some lovely constant times the frequency. So directly proportional to the frequency. And so this is interesting because if you look, if light were truly a wave, it would just be continuous and just a continuously long wave. Whereas it turns out if somehow there are discrete particles of light, if you will, so then each of those could have an associated energy and not just be simply looked at as a continuous wave, but like little light bullets that we call photons. And so it turns out you can look at properties and characteristics both in terms of light. Uh, and it turns out if you rearrange this a little bit, so the frequency here would be equal to the speed of light over the wavelength. And if you look at the energy of a photon in terms of the wavelength, 
And again, the C here assuming that we're in a vacuum. And so here we see that the energy of a photon is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So let's look at visible light for a second. So what are the boundaries? What are the very extremes in visible light? So, well, those are the wavelengths, but what are the colors? Red and blue. Red and blue. So, and we'll put red down here. And I'm going to call it violet rather than blue, but often we just kind of say blue. Um, and in this case, if you look at the wavelengths, so here we're looking at approximately 400 nanometers, and here we might be looking at like somewhere upwards of 700 nanometers. So, and this is the wavelengths for the visible spectrum. So, but the entire spectrum is much, much, much larger than this. So if you notice, uh, if we look at these in terms of frequencies or energies, so we notice wavelength is increasing going this way, but we find out that frequency as well as energy, which are direct proportional, would be increasing the other way. So even though red has the longer wavelength, it's violet that has the higher frequency and the higher energy for photons. Cool, what's right on the other side of violet light in the big electromagnetic spectrum? Ultraviolet, it has shorter wavelengths, but it has higher frequencies and higher energies. What's higher than ultraviolet? X-rays, what's higher than X-rays? Gamma rays, where do you find gamma rays? So, they cause cancer, that is true. So, but usually associated with nuclear radiation, they can be given off by the sun and things of that sort. So, and they are very harmful to you. They are so tiny that they have no problem penetrating your skin and causing your internal organs and, and your DNA mutations and ultimately having a good chance of causing cancer or killing you before you ever have a chance to get cancer. Um, if we look at it on the other side of red, on the other hand, so the other side of the visible part of the spectrum, what do we get? Infrared, what do we associate infrared with? So night vision. So it turns out that objects that are hot emit infrared light. And we can't really say that infrared light is really a heat signature. It's kind of an improper thing to say that. So however, we can often tell by the infrared light something is giving off what temperature it's at and things of this sort. Uh, so you hear like infrared thermometers and stuff like that. That's what they're really measuring. So, and heat can be transferred in the form of infrared light, but to call infrared light heat is probably not technically correct. Um, what's lower energy than infrared light? Microwaves. What do we use microwaves for? Heat our food. How does it heat our food? It makes the molecules shake around. So it makes which molecules? And it's not shake around, it makes them rotate. And which molecules specifically? Water. And so if there ain't water in your food, it probably is not going to get heated up very well. So, but most of your food has water. But hopefully the idea is that your plate that the food is on does not have water. That way your plate doesn't heat up along with your food and you can still touch it when your food's heated up. Now the fact that the food heats up and is in contact with your plates, there may still be a heat transfer, but hopefully your plate's not as hot as your food. Uh, finally, what's even lower energy than microwaves? Radio waves. And it were radio waves that were actually being transmitted in Hertz's experiment. So from his transmitter and receiver LC circuits. Cool, and obviously we know what we use radio waves for. So radio waves are involved in your cell phone transmissions, radio transmissions, my wireless microphone transmissions, so on and so forth. <coughs> cool. Uh, that relative position in the electromagnetic spectrum, you should kind of know, so who's at the highest and lowest in terms of energy or frequency or wavelength. You should also know that the boundaries in between are not concrete. So when you start meeting the boundary between like infrared and microwaves, you might find wavelengths right at the kind of the juncture in between the two that might fall into either class and there's kind of this overlap. So there's no well-defined exact lines that say, oh, now this is ultraviolet or, you know, not x-rays anymore and stuff like that. The boundaries are kind of soft. So question number one of the day. Question number one says the wavelength of violet photon is 400 nanometers. And then we're asked three questions. Actually, what is its frequency? What is its energy in joules? And then what is its energy in electron volts? So we'll start with what is its frequency? So we've got the wavelength. So in this case, if I've got the wavelength, I can get the frequency because they're related through the speed of light. And so in this case, if I rearrange that equation and solve for frequency, we're gonna get the speed of light, I'll just call it C in this case, over lambda, which in this case, what is the speed of light? 
So when I solve for frequency, what units should it come out in? Hertz, interesting enough. So, and what is a Hertz? It's a per second, a one over second, or a second to the minus one. And so in this case, what units does wavelength have to have so I can come out with one over seconds for the units of frequency? Meters. It's gotta be meters. So here, violet, we're given the wavelength as 400 nanometers. We gotta convert that to meters before we plug it in here. So in this case, I just like personally multiplying it by 10 to the negative nine, and then we're in meters. Meters will cancel, and we'll end up with inverse seconds or hertz as our units for frequency. Somebody get me that frequency. 7.5 times 10 to 14. Cool, and inverse seconds or hertz, HZ for short. Cool, second part of this question is we were asked for what is the energy either in joules as well as in electron volts. And so the energy since we have the frequency now, I'm just going to use E equals HF. If we would have started with the wavelength, we could have gone there as well. And so in this case, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds times the frequency we just got, 7.5 times 10 to the 14th hertz. And what does this give us for the energy of a violet photon. 4.96, or 4.97 times 10 to the negative 19. Okay, so that energy in joules came out to 4.9 7 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. But then you're asked what that might be in electron volts. So an electron volt, if you recall, potential energy of a charged particle in a uh, experiencing potential is QV. Or in this case, the change in potential energy would be Q delta V. And so an electron volt was described as the amount of energy change of potential energy experienced by an electron accelerated through a one volt potential. So what's the charge on an electron? Good, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and times one volt would get you 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And so that's your equivalent here. So we've got this 4.97 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And it turns out the equivalent between joules an electron volt, so that one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And so in this case, how many electron volts does this come out to be? Cool, and well, that's the third of our questions that are just getting the energy of a photon in electron volts. What would be the energy of two violet photons? 6.22 electron volts. What would be the energy of 10 you know, violet photons? 31.1 electron volts, so on and so forth, great.